Okay, hello and welcome everyone. In this video, I'm gonna talk about mergers with an example you probably might not have considered already. So usually we think of mergers as creating a situation that's worse for consumers, right? It's gonna be better for producers. We'd expect price to rise, profits to rise, and consumer surplus to fall. And this is the sort of circumstance that the Justice Department and antitrust regulators pay attention to when deciding whether or not to approve a merger. And this is often the case that there's going to be some negative effect for consumers as a result of the merger. Uh, there could be a negative effect for the firms. It could be the case that the merged firm is not more profitable than they were separately. But this is not necessarily the case. You can have a situation where everybody benefits from the merger. And here's an interesting application of economic theory, particularly oligopoly theory, to reinforce this. So the example rests on the merger involving complements right? Not substitutes, complements. And so my claim is a merger into a single monopoly firm between firms producing complements is going to give us this result. It's going to reduce the price of the system as a whole. It's going to increase the number of systems sold. It's going to increase the sum of profits. By system, I mean the two complementary goods sold together. So you think of like software and hardware or, or um, apps and so that's still software. <laughs> think of like cars and tires, whatever is the case. All right, so we're going to reduce the price of the system, meaning the monopoly selling the system is going to be less than the system price when you have firm X and firm Y pricing separately. It'll increase the number of systems sold. The monopoly quantity would be larger than the quantity of systems sold separately. And the sum of profits, the profits for the monopoly, is going to be more than the sum of firm X and firm Y separately. So let's see this. So let's define the system as a combination of compatible products, such as computers and the monitor. And then we want to de define the associated prices, PX for one part of the system, PY for the other. And these are the two components, good X and good Y, that are sold together or sold by separate sellers but are used together. The price of the system as a whole, PS, so it's going to be the sum of PX and PY. It's how much you pay for the software plus how much you paid for the hardware or how much you pay for the smartphone plus how much you paid for your data plan or whatever. Q is going to be the quantity purchased by all consumers. So the demand is going to be Q is equal to some A minus PS, where Q is the quantity demanded, A is going to be just some constant, and then PS is the price of the system. So PS is the price of good X plus price of good Y, and that's going to be just our market uh, so this would be our inverse market demand. Okay, very good. So this is our starting point. I'm going to use oligopoly theory to develop this. And hopefully, if you've watched my oligopoly videos, this very quickly, the structure very quickly looks familiar. All right, so suppose the firms choose prices and assume production is costless. Given price of good Y, firm X is going to choose its own price. So it's thinking strategically. It's going to try to maximize profit. Maximize profit. Economists use pi for profit rather than P because P is for prices. I'm going to choose by the price of good X to maximize profits for firm X. So this is price times quantity. This looks weird, but this is price of good X times the quantity of good X, right? Q is just going to be A minus uh, the sum of px and py that's just from this right here all right so this is price times quantity this is revenue we said production is costless so i'd have like minus zero for costs my first order condition my revenue maximizing price is going to be given by this reaction curve i'm not going to just get my price for good x because the price of good y is going to be included in here this looks a little bit like how we'd solve corneau right all right so solving for my reaction curve Firm X's optimal choice as a function of firm Y's price is given by A minus PY over 2. The game's symmetric, so firm Y does something similar. Firm Y's optimal choice as a function of X's price is going to be A minus PX over 2. Now we've got a system of two equations in two unknowns, and we can solve the system of reaction curves by substituting. Right, so I've just dropped PY was A minus PX over 2. I just dropped this in for PY into firm X's reaction curve. And then solving, tracing through the algebra, this has the, the Corneau pattern. The coefficients over here go 2, 4, 3. And then this is like A minus C over 3. This looks like our Corneau equilibrium. What's the difference? This is for price rather than quantity. We're, we're solving for price as the strategic variable. So this is not quite Corneau because Corneau involves quantity as the strategic variable, but it's resting on largely a similar uh, mechanical uh, way of solving. 
All right, so anyway, we find the optimal selection for firm X for its price is gonna be A over three, where A is whatever was our constant in our market demand. Firm Y is gonna set a price of A over three. So now we've got our two prices. What's the price of the system gonna be? Well, it's gonna be two A over three. All right, so if PX is equal to A over three and PY is, is equal to A over three, what's gonna be the, the total number of systems sold? Well, our demand was just gonna be A minus PX plus PY, or it's gonna be A minus two A over three. And then solving, our quantity demanded is gonna be A over three. I've just got a common denominator by multiplying by one written cleverly, three over three. So there's three A minus two A over three is gonna be A over three. So my optimal quantity is gonna be A over three with no cost, or with, uh, with, uh, with no cost, you can think of what the profits are gonna be. And so we'll see that down below in a second, it's gonna be A squared over three. But anyway, here's the situation when the firms are acting independently. Each price is gonna be A or alpha over three. Each produces a quantity of A or alpha over three. And then the profits for the two firms are gonna be A squared over nine. All right, and we're assuming zero costs. What happens if the firm merges? So what about the monopoly? The merged firm maximizes a different expression. So it's gonna maximize the price of the system as a whole, right? So profit for a firm that's producing both product X and Y jointly, it's gonna be price times demand, right? So price times quantity, and then minus cost, which was zero. So finding our first order condition, so finding the optimal price, taking our derivative, we solve, oh, we don't need a reaction curve anymore because this firm is producing the system as a whole. There's no other firm to consider. And so this is actually, this is like the monopoly price setting problem, right? Exactly, because of monopoly, right? And so price of the price of the system is gonna be alpha over two, which looks like our monopoly price, because it is. And so then what's the quantity? It's gonna be A minus, well, A over two, it's a quantity of A over two. This should be reminiscent of our monopoly quantity because you should kind of recognize this from Stackelberg a little bit, if you saw the Stackelberg video. Anyway, so what are gonna be the profits? Well, the profits are gonna be A squared over four. Well, wait a second, the profits of the monopoly are A squared over four, the profits jointly of the individual firm was A squared over nine, so two times A squared over nine. Let's compare that to A squared over four and we can get our comparison. Turns out profits are actually higher for the firm operating as a monopoly for the merger than it was jointly for or separate, you know, adding summing up the two pro, the profits for the two firms producing good X and good Y separately. What about the price? A over two is smaller than two thirds A over three. And what about the quantity? A over two is bigger than A over three, which is the quantity of the system sold, right? So as a whole, prices have fallen, the quantity risen, so consumer surplus has risen. If prices fall and quantity rises, there's more consumption, consumer surplus rises, profits rose. So what happened here is when these firms merge, when they make a monopoly, everyone, consumers and the firms win. What's happened, what's going on here, this is weird. <laughs> what's happened, well, given the components are complements, the rise in the price of one reduces the demand for the other. There's this negative externality exerted by firm X on firm Y because consumers have to buy the system as a whole, right? So the more that you're paying for your cell phone plan, the less you can spend on the cell phone itself. You buy a better smartphone if the, if the cell phone plan was cheaper because you have more money left over, other things equal. I don't know, maybe you'd buy the more expensive smartphone if you have the more expensive plan because you get more use out of it. But let's put that let's put that aside for now. Under price competition, each firm overprices its component. Each firm is only influenced by the reduced demand for its own component, not for the system as a whole. The merged firm pays attention to the complementary price uh, effects on the system, whereas the individual firms do not. And so anyway, I think this is a really interesting example. I like it because first off, it kind of gives us a different perspective to look at monopoly and to think of oligopoly and to think of merger theory, especially if complements are involved. Also, this gives us kind of a cool application of oligopoly theory in a way that you might not have considered before. So anyway, I hope you enjoy the video, like it, and then have a good, uh, good day, everyone.